All right. Are you ready? Okay. Um, we're we're uh, going to wrap up what we were talking about. Then we're going to go on into to, to the next session. And then tonight we're going to pretty much uh, just worship and pray for everyone tonight. And um, I don't know. I, I, I know that some people will be sharing from my staff. But, but I feel as though we're almost complete uh, after this session as far as the word of God being, being uh, given. And I have to do everything in, in order and I have to do everything so that you can receive everything that God has for you. And that means that we have to bring any kind of correction in our thinking, in our understanding, and we have to, have to give forth the warnings. And I will reiterate this, be very careful from now on. I have seen things in people that I know, that, that you see on TV, things like that, but I have heard and seen things happen just, just recently that, that confirms what the Lord is warning me about. And that is, is that in these end days, there will be a great falling away. And like I said, Satan will aim after leadership in order to, uh, to turn the masses. And so you have to be careful even with, within the body of Christ because Paul warned about people being deceived and to, to stay true to what, what Paul tr taught. He said that even if an angel comes and says something different than what I said, he said, let it be him be a curse. He said, don't listen to even an angel if he says something different than what I said. That's how bold Paul was. So we're going to stick with, with what the Bible says. We're going to stick with the basics. And if you don't understand something, just stick with what you do understand and be very, very uh, appointed by that. Thank you. Um, but be aware that as, as the money flow starts to decrease, that people will get desperate. So be, be reminded of, uh, uh, I watch because the Lord has asked me, I, I, I usually don't share these things because then you'll know what's going on in my head. And sometimes you just need to know um, that there's everything that I do is for a reason, but I'm telling you what's going on in my head. The Lord is telling me to watch everything that people say and do because there's going to be personality changes. There'll be, people will start to change on you. I've had my best friends change onto me to where I had to sever my relationship and get away as fast as possible because it, would, it, it starts to affect everyone. I'm telling you, if people give way to evil spirits, it doesn't matter who they are. If they give way to them, they start to listen, then it will change their course. But if their leadership, it'll change the course of everyone under them. Do you understand that? That's what it is about authority is you got to remember if you have a commanding officer and he's telling you what to do, but he's telling you to turn on your country. Well, then at a certain point, you got to reconsider if your commanding officer has gone rogue and he's not sticking with the mission, then you got to decide, well, you're pretty much on your own, just so you know. But I mean, most people will follow somebody right into a pit, so right into a hole. And I am not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I talked, how many of you know we have demonstration, flight demonstration teams in the United States called the Thunderbirds and the Blue Angels? The Blue Angels are Navy, and then there's the Thunderbirds, which are the Air Force. Well, I know a lot of those pilots that flew for those demonstration teams, they were, they were friends while I was at the airline. They sat and told me things that I would never have known. But they found that the leader of those demonstration teams, if they let the leader stay in that position past the two-year mark, they would have accidents where the lead would take the whole team into the ground on the third year. It was the third year curse, they called it. What happened was they, were, they, they determined that the lead had gotten so comfortable that he started to let off. So on the tops of maneuvers where they're supposed to pull the G's and it's uncomfortable, in order, if you don't pull it at the top, you end up paying it back at the bottom of the loop. So if you're out, 
of sync, of out of range on what you're supposed to do, you end up having to, to make it up in the maneuver at the end, which is very hard to do. You're, you get too behind, it's impossible. So what would happen was is the, everyone's following the lead, but the lead has led off on, on the stick, so to speak, on the maneuver. So you end up be coming up short on the pullout. Well, you can't be short on the pullout if you've only got 500 feet to spare because 500 feet at 500 miles an hour is not even a second uh, as far as your response time. So if you notice, they try to hide it, <laughs> but if you look it up, there were times where the whole team went in right into the ground. And you know, you know what I'm thinking because that, that got to where this happened several times. And he'd, so I noticed that the, the two ones that were in the diamond were outside. I, I saw them in films later when this, was, this happened, they would peel off because they would figure it out. There's this guy's off. And they would actually live. And then the four diamond instead of the six diamond would go into the ground. Does everybody follow what I mean? So you have a diamond shape, you have four aircraft. Yeah, you're supposed to have six. So the two on the outside, they had a way out because they weren't in, they didn't, they had a way to peel out and not hit somebody. So they're like, this guy's messed it up. And so at a fraction of a second, they were able to survive it. Okay, so they decided now that nobody gets to stay the third year. They rotate through. And um, I met somebody that actually had a, it was almost like a congressional thing in order to get a person to have that third year again. But I, I know someone who actually, even after all that, they had determined that this person was of that type of character that he would not do that. And so they gave him that third year and I know him. And he, he was able to complete that third year and lead uh, without any accidents and things like that. Now, so I'm saying that because um, you have to be also individually being led by the Spirit of God at all times. And it always should confirm in your spirit what's going on. You should blindly follow somebody except Jesus himself. But in these days that are ahead, I'm just warning you, Write it down. Is that there are those you thought could not be deceived that will be deceived. It's, it's, already, it's already apparent to me, but there, it might take you some time. What you have to discern is, is, is the person really feeding you spiritually? Or are they just saying funny things or things that sound good, but are they, they spiritual? Are they, are they sharp as a sword? Is it the word of God? Is it, is it really ministering to your spirit or is it something that's ministering to your ego or to your head? It, it's, it's a, it's, it's something that you're going to have to remember from now on. When you do something, when you say something, you better be sure it's God from now on. You better check it out with God. You better give it some time. And Jesus is not going to make you make a decision where you don't feel like you have time to seek him about it. He's not, if you have pressure to make a decision and you don't have enough time to make, to make that decision based on prayer, it's not God. Don't let situations pressure you into making a decision about something if you don't have time to seek God about it. Amen? Okay. All right. Good. All right. I can go on now. Now, the, if, you, if you look up uh, another friend of mine, Kirby, Kirby Chambliss, he was the, the airbag champion of the world for, for, the, for Red Bull. And um, he was a, a captain friend of mine. We started together at, at our airline. He's actually back there. He had, he had two years left before he could retire. He actually retired from aerobatics and is now flying for, for my, the airline that I work for just to finish out his retirement. He still had two years, so he's doing that right now. But this guy was a captain at 23 years old for our airline. But he would practice. He would ask me, can you go with me on weekends and film me? I have this 
this aerobatic plane and I, I want to someday fly in air shows. And, and he became the, the best in the world. But when, we, when he would practice, we would go to some air for, airfield that was very obscure and um, I would just do what I was told. I would fly with him in formation in my little airplane and he would fly in his and I would film him and then we would go and I would film, film him doing his airbags, taking pictures and things like that. And then I remember one day he said, okay, um, what do you want to do? He says, I'm done. I said, well, let's just fly back and um, we can go eat. And he goes, well, my girlfriend wants to go to the fair, you know, the state fair there in Arizona in Phoenix, Arizona. And um, I said, well, um, hey, we can go fly. You know, there was, they had these rides there, you know, these, these kind of rides that you'd, you know. And he goes, oh, I'm not doing that. That's not safe. I go, and what you just did was, sa- was because I'm serious, because that guy would take off and he would, it was a, a pit. Uh, so it's a pits, it's a double wing airplane, but it's it's got you know uh, an engine that way that gives more thrust and way more than that airplane weighs. And he would take off and kick the rudder, and he'd flip it over and flip back over, and he'd you know I'm talking like he's only 100 feet off the ground. He's already flipped it like this in this weird way, and then he goes up and he's flying upside down. He say, okay, lay on the runway. So I'm laying on the runway with my camera, and he comes upside down over me. And the wind was moving me down the runway from the airplane. I'm like, this, this can't be legal, you know. It's like, <laughs> so I'm like, well, you find somebody else. Find a monkey to do this, you know. I'm not going to do this anymore. But he was doing all these things. And if you look him up online, look him up online on YouTube. You're, this guy was amazing. But yet he, he said it was dangerous to go on these rides. <laughs> And I go, why do you, why? He says, well, what I'm doing is predictable. He said, I do it thousands and thousands of times. He said, I'm going to trust myself to machinery and people that are like, you know, carnivals, you know, like a, a circus type thing. You know, I'm not, no, I'm not, we're not going to do that. And I, that always amused me. But then as I listened to him and I watched him practice when he was not known, I realized that that there is in within people. I mean, think of it. He became, he became the best in the world. But he practiced all the time. But he, this is what he said. He said, what I do, I make it predictable. He said, I do it over and over again. He, he said, I used to, before you knew me, I used to do it way up like 1,000, 2,000 feet to where if I, something happened, I could recover. And then he said, I kept bringing it down <laughs> as I got better. And he got it to where I could do it right after takeoff, where no one else would do that, you know. And um, so you can watch his aerobatic um, his demonstrations and stuff. But this is somebody I know. He's the, the nicest person. His, his wife, uh, who was his girlfriend at the time, Kelly, she is a, I used to fly with her. She's a flight attendant. And we used to fly together. She's the nicest person. I've never met anybody nicer than her, except for Jesus, you know. She is so kind. And he was so kind, but they didn't claim to know Jesus or anything. But it's interesting. She's a pilot now. I mean, they probably don't even know where I'm at at all, unless they've seen me online. But they probably don't even know, keep track of me. But I've kept track of them and pray for them all the time. And Kirby, K-I-R-B-Y, Chambliss, like champion, but C H A M B L I S. Maybe another S, I don't know. Depends on what country you're from, I don't know. Kirby Chambliss and Kelly. Anyway, they, they don't even know, um, they probably don't know, uh, haven't gotten in contact with me. It probably would be a surprise to see where I'm at. But I'm saying this because I've come in contact with people that are excellent in areas, but they don't claim to have faith necessarily, even though I know they do believe in God and, 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 you know, I know them enough to know that they believe in God for sure. But think about how a person as a hobby would practice and do this and then end up, end up becoming the best as a, to where he could quit his airline job. But they, it became predictable. But then when I talk to pilots, like I just talked to you, is that they determined that at a certain point, that third year, you start to relax 
in it. And then you start making mistakes. And that's what I'm telling you the Spirit's telling me about right now, is we need to pray for ministers, we need to pray for all Christians, but we need to pray for leadership right now. That the people that are set in the church, the, the fivefold, that they stay on course and that they stay very diligent right now. And, and pray that God really gets a hold of them and helps them. Because if not, there won't be the blessing anymore. And, and the money will, will dwindle. The support will dwindle. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. So we don't, we, in a way, if they're not, the, the correction, if they don't make the correction, we understand that has to happen. But God doesn't want that to happen. But he's going to have to replace them with your five-year-olds. He's going to have to replace them with, with people that are anointed with fire. And God will bring them forth. You don't want the rocks to cry out and be louder than you, like Jesus said. If you silence these people, the rocks will cry out. You, you, do you understand? Everything I'm saying is scriptural. But what I'm telling you is, is that even in the world, we find more excellence than we do in the church. You got it, right? Right? Okay, so this, this just happened. I, I, had to, I, had to, I had to stop for fuel in Phoenix, Arizona. I had done training there. We have to take, um, I mean, you have to here in, in Europe for sure. You have to take what they say, they call upset training. And so they, they have to put you through. It's usually a three or four day course. All the pilots have to go through it where they put you upside down. They put you in a spin. They put you in different things. And then you have to get to trained to get out of it because airliners and cor especially corporate jets are, are getting into these situations. And if you're up at 45,000 feet, if you're up there at eight miles high, you, um, you're, the air is very thin. And that's where we go. We go to 45,000 feet because the fuel will burn is almost half of what it is down low. So you can go twice as far once you get up there. And so we, we do everything to get up there. We tell the controllers, please, we'll, we'll tip you. We'll, do, we'll, we'll send you a hamburger, whatever. Get us up there quickly. Because um, if not, we're going to have to go for fuel. Um, and we're, have to, we're not going to make it nonstop. I'm talking like you could burn two hours worth of fuel more if you stay down low. Okay, so with the fighter jet, we can, we, uh, you know, we, we're on oxygen, we're going up, but um, sometimes they keep us low and sometimes um, this, there's storms up there. It doesn't help you to go up there if you're having to dodge thunderstorms and lightning bolts, you know, uh, so that, that we have to stop every hour in a fighter jet because you go really fast, but you have to, it's just between fuel stops, you know, you're going fast, but between fuel stops. So you, you only have an hour's worth of fuel usually. So we stopped in Phoenix, Arizona, which is where I had my upset training. My upset training was four days, and it was some of the hardest stuff I've had to ever do. And, um, you know, nothing about it was normal, and nothing was happy and good feeling, and it was all scary. But it's so that if you ever get in a situation where you find yourself flipped over, upside down, which can happen very quickly, the air is very thin up there, and if you if you want to recover, it takes thousands and thousands of feet to recover, whereas down low, the air is thicker, and you can get the airplane back in control again. But you can lose 10, 12,000 feet just, be, just because you flipped over. And in most cases, if you read the, the statistics, it takes 20,000 feet. And you usually bend the wings by the time you get out of it. Okay, so they don't want that. They want you to react right away roll the airplane back over and get it flying again. But the air is thin up there. Okay, so I went through this training and it made me a better pilot than I could ever be doing anything else. It made me a better pilot going through that than all my training. Because what it did was it exposed me to what can happen, but it also exposed me to what the airplane is capable of doing and experiencing it to where it became something that didn't, it took away the shock factor of having something happen and being upside down. And that, abil that, that uh, inability to act because you're paralyzed for a little bit over it. 
Does everybody understand what I'm saying? And this is why I'm telling you, we need to be trained how to pray and how to walk in the spirit and how to deal with discrepancies that happen, things that happen that are not predictable, things that may happen that will cause you to hesitate or to freeze up or to quit. You can't quit. You got to continue on. You can't just throw your hands up and give up. So I landed there a couple weeks ago just to get fuel. And my instructor, who where the school is, he was there that day. So I had texted him and said, hey, listen, he doesn't know. I'm actually flying in the same airplane that he flies in, that we were trained in. I am now a captain in it. So when I met this man, I thought, man, he's flying this fighter jet and he's doing all this. Well, it ends up that I used to serve him coffee at work at Southwest Airlines. He was a captain for Southwest Airlines and I was a flight attendant and I would serve him coffee and now he's my instructor. And he goes, Kevin, is that you? And I go, Otter, is that you? <laughs> he couldn't believe it. He goes, I'm calling my wife because I used to fly, fly with his wife too as well. And he's like, I can't believe this. What are you doing? I go, well, I'm, I'm a corporate pilot now and I'm um, taking this training. And so he was a born again, spirit filled Christian. So we're, we're talking, we're taking off and doing loops and rolls and stalls and spins. And, and we're talking about speaking in tongues. And we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm thinking, you can't make this up. And he goes, I can't believe you're doing all this. He said, you, you have any, you're, you're the only one that's never gotten sick. I go, I eat this stuff. I mean, this is what I, this is what I was, I live for. I, I have my dream back. He was so touched. He goes, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to find out about your courses and your school. He came to my meetings that night while I was at school. He came, we had meetings there. He came to the meetings all right, so I called him. I didn't hear from him because he's out flying. So when I did the fuel stop, I want to show you. I want to show you how God could turn it around for you if you're just diligent. Is Here he is in the airplane. He's in the airplane that I trained with him in. And he was like, you know what? I can't really let you land. You're going to make me nervous. I'll, maybe I'll let you take off, okay? So he let me take off. He goes, I can't really let you, you know, this is a really hot aircraft. Okay, so now I've landed. I'm flying across the country in this thing. I'm a captain in it. It's the same airplane that he has. I land and he's sitting in one waiting to take off. And he goes, Kevin. He calls the tower. He goes, Kevin, is that you? And I go, yeah. And I'm waving with my helmet on and he's waving with it. And I'm thinking, how do you make this up? He didn't even know. Until recently that I had gotten my rating. He actually didn't hardly believe it. He called the person. He said, did you just give Kevin his rating? <laughs> the FDFA guy. Yeah. And he goes, yeah. Because there's only one person in the United States can give this rating. So everybody know, every all the pilots, there's only 30 some of us that have the rating in that jet, in that military jet. So as far as like this, that country, you know, it's, they have them in the Philippines. They still use them in their military. They still use them. I think in Thailand, they just released them and got another jet. But um, the bottom line, there's a group of pilots. They all know each other. And so they're, he's like, he says, I am, so, this is what he wrote. He texted me after takeoff. And um, of course, I wouldn't look at my phone while I'm taking off because that's not allowed, you know. But he said, I am so proud of you. I can start crying right now because you gotta, you gotta understand that God has taken me further than I can go on my own, but he's doing it for you. He's, he's displaying what he wants to do in your life. He wants to take you further, but you have to establish the truth that is in the gospel. You have to be established in the truth and then you have to know that truth. And not only are you set free, but you stay free. And then you don't have the mindset that you can't do something. God, I wait for Jesus to give me permission to do the things. I'm standing in the stall kicking, wanting to get out. I'm ready. There's so many programs and things that I want to do. I've been on delay for a year on some things. 
but people have to be patient with me and they are because I have to wait until it's the proper time slot and then he releases me to do it and then it's done like that. But sometimes it takes a year from when I announce it. Okay, you have to understand this in a spirit is that there's things that he's going to tell you that are happening in the spirit realm right now, that, but there is a delay in the manifestation of it. And we see this in the book of Daniel, of course, is one good example of this. The delay was, is that the angels were sent the day that, that, that Daniel prayed, but there was the, 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 the fight going on, the 21 days in the heavenlies. But it worked out for Daniel because he actually got a revelation of days that we live in now as well. So there was a peek into the way future. He even said, seal it up. Don't even write it. Don't talk about this. Seal it up because that's for the time of the end. You know, so even Daniel knows things that we don't know. But think about it. He was just praying for his situation at the time, his people, you know, he was stuck in Babylon, you know. So he's probably staring at the Ishtar gates that you have in Berlin, you know. No, I mean, think about it. You know, it's kind of wild, isn't it? And think about the fact that he was reading a major prophet. Daniel was a prophet, but he was reading a scroll that Jeremiah had wrote. I mean, think about that. He was reading the scroll of Jeremiah, and he realized that what Jeremiah had written was pertaining exactly to them. And, and that the 70 years of captivity had ended, but they were still in captivity. And so he, it says there, if you will call out to me, fast and pray and humble yourself and cry out to me, I will hear you and answer you. And I will bring you back into your own land. And so Daniel saw that and realized that the 70 years, because it says at the end of the 70 years is what Jeremiah wrote. So he calculated, it was actually, um, some scholars say it was over 70 years. It was like six months past that, six to eight months. So they were actually overdue. But it seems to me that it took Daniel seeing it in the word of God to trigger it. Which is kind of weird, isn't it? That it was overdue, but it hadn't gotten into the 71st year yet. But... He initiated something in the spirit when he prayed that day. The angels were sent, but they had to fight. And so I have to tell you that the preparation that people um, have just to accomplish the stories I've told you and how at the end, you know, how all these people in my life, they come back around, you know, and it's all, it's all like meant to be. It's just amazing how now the person who, even though I'm raided in the jet, God woke somebody up at night, an F-18 pilot, the, a lieutenant colonel who had retired and said, you drop everything you have for a year and you help Kevin. And so he dropped everything. And then instead of all these other pilots, which are F-18 pilots as well, military, he He's, he's kind of like the president of that company. And he, I'm telling you, he's a, he's a strong Christian. And um, he, he is right on with all the training. And the, so he wanted to sharpen me up, which, which I, I pretty much have to ask for. So he goes, okay. So, so he comes and he goes, well, you know, I was just told to drop the airplane off and go home. And you were to do all this, and then I'm either going to come pick it up when you're done, or you're going to fly it back. And I go, oh, no, can you stay? I'll pay you to stay. He goes, well, it's up to you. I go, yeah, I want you to stay, but I want you to make me the best fighter pilot in this airplane. And he goes, well, we can do that. So I noticed after that, that all the time for preparation in each mission and each flight and everything and all the books and the... It, even though I, I'd already completed everything and, and I can, I can actually just, you know, I have it arranged. If I want that airplane, I can just purchase it and it could be ours. So it's ours. I can do that, but there is this thing that opened up to me where I could be better. And the better is having somebody that's at that level to bring me up to where they are, which, which isn't required just so you know. I mean, if the FAA signed me off that day, I flew out with that airplane. That's my airplane. 
I can take Kathy, I can take you, I can do anything I want, as long as you just don't touch anything. <laughs> and don't scream too loud when I'm upside down, you know? But, but that wasn't what was in my heart. I wanted to be the good. It's the same thing. I still, even though I'm flying the captain on my airplane and Sven was my instructor and he's seated, seated now as the first officer, I'm still asking him questions all the time. I'm asking him, hey, in this situation, what would you have done? He goes, well, you did the right thing. He said, but if you do this, this, and this, he said, you, at the end there, when you make your turn, you won't be as fast and it's probably better if you do this, this, and this. He goes, you just need to do this. Just tweak it here. It's constant, but it doesn't mean that, that you know, the FAA always said I'm a captain, mm -hmm. but I, I'm not going to let go of these people in my life. These people are like up here. 30 years, 40 years, uh, you know, 20 years of flight flying, all the experience that they have that I haven't even experienced in my two years. I haven't experienced everything they've experienced. So there's scenarios that happen. That's why I wanted to share from my heart this morning, even though I get criticized for, for talking about these things, because no one else will, but it's the demons that are influencing people to criticize because they, the demons don't want you to know. But see, the thing that is, it's just like this. I could sit there and stare at my ratings about all my airplanes, but one day I'm going to get in a situation where if I, I'm, I'm going to be able to do something because of all these pilots in my life that I tapped into, I'll get out of it and live. And that's what I want for you is you get into a situation where it may be that you learn from me, zip your lip, turn around and walk away. Don't say a word. And don't even allow yourself to be drawn into something. Don't allow yourself to be get to get into a pickle where there's no way out. You got time. You got to see that things are working it their, your way uh, into a a place where you can't get out. It gets tight. Satan wants to do that. I'm telling you, you'll be so sharp. You'll say, you know what? I'm out. This is wrong. And I'm telling you right now, some of the things that are being taught and said are not right. And we're getting into a pickle. In aviation, it's called a coffin box. A coffin box is as you go up higher, the stall speed and the, the for, for low airspeed and high speed, they converge to where it's six knots difference. So you can stall at a very high speed because you're too slow because of the air too thin, but you can overspeed and stall because of the Mach number going almost the speed of sound. And we're, we're at that at 45, at 45,000 feet, it's the things converging both ways. In a U-2 spy plane, SR-71 spy plane, when they're up there at 120,000 feet, which you don't know, that's classified, so forget it. But I mean, it's, you're up there, it's going like this, and you see these two red tapes coming on your airspeed like this. You, and the, you too, spy plane, you only got four knots of, of margin between low stall speed and high stall speed. So you gotta be right on it all the time. Well, if you get a hiccup or something in the air, it could change your airspeed. Okay, you don't want to get in these situations unless you have a space suit on. So your life, sometimes you'll find yourself feeling like you're pressed in a situation where you can't get out of. You have to be open to say, listen, things have changed. You've got to let the Lord say to you, things are closing in because the powers that be around you and the things, the situation, people have been hijacked. It was God's will for you to be with that person. It was God's will to be at that church, to have that pastor. It's God's will to have church right now. I mean, we should all have church. We should all be able to go to church and have the fivefold, five, not the no fold or the one fold, but fivefold ministry. You should all, ha we should all have that. But see, man has gotten involved and man has gotten hijacked. Man doesn't always stay faithful. They stare at the money. They stare at the crowds. Now, for instance... I've done this. I mean, uh, I remember in Georgia, in Dalton, Georgia, in the United States, we had 1,800, well, it was, it was booked to 1,800. I think we had 14 or 1,500 people 
there in that convention center. And I asked, you know, the, my friend said, can you do me a favor? The local pastor wants to, to do the communion for one service. You know, he loves you, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, I made the mistake of saying yes. So what happens is, is the power that's in here, if I would hand somebody the microphone, it's going to be hard to get it back from them. Because the power is so strong that all of a sudden, everything that's in you from Sunday school when you were a kid is going to come out <laughs> under the anointing and the power. So this was at the beginning of our ministry. And um, so I learned not to let go of the microphone, just hold it. But that man was supposed to say the the small um, three verses in First Corinthians you know, about, the, about the, and then go like this, like this and like this, you know. I mean, maximum 35 seconds, you know. 20 minutes later, I mean, he's going back and forth on the stage and we're trying to catch him, you know. And he said, I cannot stop preaching. I go, welcome to my world. I said, that's not you. That's not your anointing. That's the corporate anointing. All these people are hungry. They're going to draw off of you. Okay, so then my friend uh, who, who, who allowed this, I, he got up and did it. He goes, oh, my God. He goes, I could, I, I, I stared at you, and I knew I had to stop. And he's like, I, it's hard to stop. I said, so, yeah, that's the way it is. Okay, so you have to know not just what, is coming out of you. You got to know the timing for everything and know when it's time to just walk away. There's other things involved here besides what you think. Just because you have something or you, Paul said, let it be done decently in order. Everybody has a word. Everybody has a prophecy. In other words, you got to line them up, but you, we're not going to get to everybody. And God honors the speaker. He said, honor the speaker that's, that's there. Don't over um, talk over them. Excuse me. So now in your life, everything that God has invested in you, things that you've encountered, whether you think it's good or bad, everything now has culminated to the place where you're at. Now you're going to have to let the Holy Spirit use those things to help others. And how you minister to others is going to be based on that. However, there are certain things that have happened to you that, that um, are not what God wanted. And it may have put filters or improper ways of thinking and processing things into your thoughts. So how you process things may not be correct. And not only that, just to make sure that I offend all the devils and, um, and some people too probably, but um, parts of your personality are not of God. And you'll find this out when these things leave. When they leave, when entities leave your presence that they have been influencing you, then you no longer have that support for that personality trait. If it's not of God, it's going to fall off. It's, go, it's not going to prosper. It was being fed. So you have certain ways of processing things, personality things. And it's really, I'm only saying this because I have to, but it, I, I understand you're not going to see it until the, these things leave. So one day you're going to feel free because as you grow, you're going to be overcoming things in your life and you're going to be shedding these things. And thank God your kids are going to be so happy that you're doing this because they don't have to put up with this. And it won't be transferred if you beat the living daylights out of these giants and you take them out, then your kids don't have to deal with them because you took them out. That's your assignment. Every, every generation has to take out their giants and hand off an inheritance to the next generation. So your kids are really, even though they don't know it, they really depend upon you to make sure that the demons aren't even breathing, moving, anything, that they are done, that they, they don't come back, they don't touch you. So what I'm saying is there'll be times where you'll feel things leave, whether it be right now as I'm talking or tonight. Yeah, there you go. 
or maybe just, you know, a year from now. But what will happen is things will leave and all of a sudden you will notice that something else about you is gone. And you'll realize that something was influencing your thinking and your feelings about it. And once that is gone, then there's nothing to enforce that anymore. You realize it wasn't you and you realize it wasn't God. That's all I can tell you. But the best way to explain it is for you to have it happen, which it will happen. It has happened to me after I've gone to heaven. It happens to me still till today is that there are certain things that I saw in heaven that were coming against my lineage, coming against me to try to enforce some sort of trait that would be transferred to the children so that they act like that. And I found this out because uh, I asked, I go, why do, you, why do you cut the ends off of the roast at Christmas time? The, the ribeye roast, why do you cut the ends off? And so my mom didn't know. So she asked my grandma. She goes, well, I had to do it because we didn't have a large pan. <laughs> and I th I'm like, what? So you waste the roast for no reason? Well, she said, I thought that's what you do. You cut the ends off, you know. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that we do with our Christianity. We automatically assume that this is what you do. And then one of your kids is smart enough to say, Mom, why do we do this? And you know what? God wants to know why we do it too. <laughs> He's got to insert himself in your life today and start to create space between what's him and what's not him. And that's what the word of God is supposed to do. It's supposed to cut and separate so that you can see what's your soul and what's your spirit. So there's spirit and soul. Soul doesn't necessarily contain all the truth. Your soul is, is the psychological part of you based on what the Greek word means. It's the mind, will, and emotions. Now, there is an organic part of you, your brain, that is, is part of the process. But I, what I'm talking about is there's you, and then there's the way God made you and what he means, he means you to be, which has to do with the word of God uh, coming in and causing transformation, as it says in Romans 12. So Romans 12 talks about a transformation in the soul, which is the psychological part of you, the mind, will, and emotions. That is transformed by renewing of the mind, which is transformation and change. That doesn't happen because you're born again. Because the next day you still think the same way and your body still wants the same things. You have to bring correction. You find yourself in a war and it was a war the whole time, but you just weren't resisting it because your spirit wasn't strong. So once your spirit gets strong and correct, then you have a guidance system. Then all of a sudden you, you have like all these issues. Well, those issues were there. Everybody wanted to tell you about them, but now the Holy Spirit's telling you about them. So you have that correction. It's got to come. You know, you do this, you do this, and then you become excellent. And then your, your, your mentors are proud of you. And you, and you can even excel past your mentors. So I'm seeing this process in the world. Some of them are spirit-filled, some are not. But I'm telling you that what I have shared with you will really literally change your pathway to where at the end of your life, after this session and all these other sessions, you will end up better than you were going to. Strictly based on the fact that the spirit wants to say things to you all the time, but it's almost like you need someone else to say them and give you permission. And I don't want at the end of this age, after everyone who has gone before us has preached and been diligent, I wouldn't want them to, after done all of that, to be disappointed in us. I also, after all that you've gone through and the price you've paid to just be where you are today, I would not want that to go to waste by being deceived in any way in the days to come. It's not going to be like it has been. And it might even be harder in this country than it would be somewhere else. However, this is where you're assigned. Wherever you're assigned to is where you're at. And that's what you're going to do. 
However, the body of Christ needs to encourage each other, especially in these days ahead, so that we know the truth and we keep that uh, right in front of us, paramount. Okay, so um, what I want to share today is in Romans 5, 5, it says this, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has poured has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So God's love has been poured into our hearts right now. So somewhere within you right now is that love, regardless of if you know it or experiencing it. It's there. It, it can be tapped into. So just knowing that you know now that it, that it is something that you're going to have to be diligent about in order to experience God's love, knowing it's there, but it's not evident. You're going to have to be diligent to grab it. Just like I can tell you, if you pray today, there's going to be a war for 21 days in the spirit. There might be more because of, of you know, whatever y'all are dealing with here in Germany is Jurassic Park, you know, it's just... <laughs> I mean, whatever, whatever, you know, I, I mean, South Africa, I mean, South Africa, everybody should have to go to South Africa to train spiritually. <clears throat> but we... We can learn something from you. I'm learning something from you, but I don't want it to be more than three days because that's about all I can take. Because the spiritual atmosphere here is very, very stout, very strong. This, will this give me a better attitude as well? Okay. All right. Because you realize in just a week, I think this is my 17th service in a week. Yeah. So six, 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 and six. So 18 services, three spirit schools, I think like nine days, 10 days. Um, yeah, I'm done. I mean, when you start hearing accordions and harmonicas in your head, I mean, we're, we're down to, we're down to, uh, yeah, we're, we're down to soft food, dark room, candles, you know, we're, it's going to be a while before you see me again. I'm telling you. <laughs> no, not here. I'm talking about, I'm going to go home and rest. I'm not talking about coming back. I will come back when the Lord tells me to, but, but. You, all of you have to realize that your spiritual atmosphere is, is a lot stronger and um, more um, challenging than most. And so for the quality of people that I feel, if you notice, I don't have to do a lot to get you all ready. I mean, I mean, you looked a little scary the first day, but I mean, after that first service, you all lightened up. I mean, you, you've been, you're battle ridden. But you should see your faces. They're actually glowing. It actually looks like you have circulation going through your skin now, you know, because you, you, you've been traumatized and you needed, you needed God to, to send someone to you. I, I understand that. But you wouldn't believe how fast it happened. It happened in one session. Amen. It usually takes me several sessions to get you to even um, like being a Christian, you know. <laughs> Because it's so hard. Most people don't know how hard it is to be a Christian. And unless they're in an antichrist type of spirit where there's, there's things working behind the scenes and you can feel it. You feel the pressure on you spiritually. And I can see that. And I don't want that to happen to the United States, but it's happening. It's happening to the United States at an alarming rate. I'm actually looking on a map to figure out what country I'm going to flee to. 
Never thought that would happen, you know. So you're, you're, you're encountering these, these, these environments, but you got to remember that deep within you is that love of God, as we just read in Romans 5.5. 5. Um, Psalms 136.26 says this, Give thanks to the God of heaven for his steadfast love endures forever. Okay, so not only is that love in you, but it actually endures forever. Which means he's not going to turn the spigot off or slow it down. or He's not doing something to get your attention. The first thing God does is he talks to you in your spirit, which is not audible words. It's more of a green light and a red light. Or a caution light, yellow. That's how God speaks to me about 80 to 90% of the time. It's less than 1% he's ever spoken to me audibly. And most of the time, he speaks to me through his word. But it is a, I, I look at, I read the word, like I just read one Psalms, Psalms 136, 26. I, I had that sense in my spirit as I was reading that to you that it, my spirit lit up and I felt lighter as I was reading it. And that, that green light is what I'm looking for when I'm praying. And when I'm walking in the spirit, I'm looking for the same kind of sense of the witness of the spirit when God speaks his word. I start to match that up with what I'm saying, what my leaders are saying, what my friends are saying, and then what my circumstances are saying, I match it up with, with that. That's how I've learned how to walk. And I know that certain things are going to change. So you can't like necessarily say, okay, so if, um, cause you know, the markets, the, the financial markets are completely rigged. So you, you know, even if God tells you to go do something, you better be ready to get out as fast as you got in because th those are being controlled. By, by things that you, you couldn't even draw on a piece of paper. If you looked at what was being controlled, Satan is controlling all that. Satan is controlling because he is in charge of the financial markets. You didn't get that memo. Look at you all. Look at Satan, because of the multitude of his trafficking, his merchandising in Hebrew, he, was, his, he corrupted his, his, his temples, his tabernacles. It says he corrupted his sanctuaries because of the multitude of his merchandising, trafficking. So iniquity was found in him through the multitude. He was lifted up in pride, but he, was the, he became the middleman and he manipulated everything. So it was no longer free market. You all look like you've never heard this before. I know you have. Come on now. Do you have sand on your head? Have you had your head in the sand the whole time? I mean, you got to, you got to wake up. Satan was in charge down here. He was taking care of things for God. He was the cherub that covers. If you look it up, he was head of the garden. He was the marshal. He was a head over the sanctuaries of God. He was over everything down here. And he went rogue because he looked in the mirror too much and he beheld his beauty and he, he would became corrupted. And he used the fact that he had all these connections. He started manipulating. And instead of us being able to go to each other and do fair trade because you had apples, I had oranges. Uh, we could just trade. He started being the middleman and then charged a fee. And that's where we get all this. Look at you all. Come on. <laughs> you understand that this is what's happened to the body of Christ is you don't need to go through some mediator. There's only one mediator between God and man, that's Jesus Christ. And he's already mediated, trust me. He's already done it for us and he's seated. So this whole idea that we've got to go through somebody to get to God and that you got to come to my meeting to hear from God because Kevin might have a word for you. Trust me, 
That ain't going to happen. I, 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 I am forbidden from being the middleman. The Lord said, stop it for a while. They need to get out of diapers. And so for seven years, I, have, I don't give out words. And the thing that is, is I can give them out, but I'm not going to do it because you got to hear from God. You got to learn. You got to get to that level and you got to let God talk to you and guide you. You got to grow up. You don't need your instructor all the time. You got to solo sometimes. I'm not going to be there to tell you who you're supposed to marry because you're going to come after me if they turn out to be a numbskull. And it's the same thing with investments. God could tell you to invest in something, but you got to be ready to get out because there are times where I made huge amount of money in 24 hours. I thought I was staying in forever. And it was a drive-by I was supposed to do. I've lost money because I thought, no, it's going to keep going up. Well, it never did. So do you want to enter into the devil's territory? Do you want to go and gamble when it's all rigged? You got to be kidding me. I mean, did you ever just sit back and watch things instead of participate in them? You ought to watch things. You know what? I did this one time. All my friends, you know, on the airline, they, you know, we go to Las Vegas, they want to gamble. I'm like, why would you want to do that? Just give me your money. <laughs> Don't give it to them. I would say, no, just, I said, if you want to win at Vegas, you go buy the food. I'm serious. The, the steak dinners are, are, are under five bucks. I mean, that's a baked potato steak and, and, they, while you're at, the, but they want you to go to the machines where they're right there and gamble. And so they'll give you free alcohol. They'll just like free. You're like, wow, everything's free. They're like, yeah, just keep going, I guess. <laughs> okay. So this, I was watching this. I was watching all this. I wasn't on the carousel. I was off watching everything. And, I, and then I started to see familiar people standing there in suits with earpieces. Yes, yes. And then uh, my friends are like, does anybody remember, like it's an American, it's an American TV show, but it was called Wheel of Fortune. Yeah, of course, yes, yes. Well, you'd remember Vanna White, right, Joe? Yes. But it's interesting because uh, they had one of those there that you could gamble, like you could put money on different things on the wheel and then you spin it. Look just like Will Ford. It just looked like the TV show. The, that Pat Sajak wasn't there, but I mean. Oh, you gonna play? No. Why? It's rigged. You go. How's it rigged? I go. Come here. So I was standing back. I've been watching for twenty minutes because what I do with every machine, every pilot, I watch everything. I watch how you even study. You know. I'm watching everybody, I'm learning, but I'm looking for something that you wouldn't see if you're on the carousel. That's why Jesus is asking us to get out of the world, separate ourselves, get off the carousel. Don't be, you know, why do you want to sit on a fake horse and go around and say, wow. I mean, get a real one that'll kick you off, you know, but. But I, I sit and I think kids are like, wow, thanks, mommy and daddy. We got to ride the carousel. The I'm like, well, when they grow up and they have bills, that horse better make them some money, you know. In other words, you can't just go and just this make-believe thing. So I was standing there back and they're like just dumping money into this thing. And they're, and they're like, why won't you play? I go, watch this. Watch her foot. So she's sitting there, this lady's sitting here. And she's dressed, maybe dressed, she's half dressed, so that you look at certain parts of her body. You're not looking at her feet, trust me, you're not looking at her feet, okay? Because they're not that good looking, but there's other things that are gonna draw you attention. I'm serious, I'm serious. Okay, so no one's looking at her feet, but it just looks like carpet. But I noticed as soon as somebody picks something, she puts her foot right here and she presses it so that it stops right before that and it doesn't hit what you, what you picked. And then she goes back where her foot moves back. So uh, she's like, yeah, go ahead and play. You know, she's joining in. Yeah, come on, you know. I go, okay, I get to run it. 
She goes, oh, no. I go, yeah, I'm going to put my foot right here. She goes, get out of here. <laughs> so now I'm not allowed back there, you know. <laughs> Why am I not allowed back there? Because I exposed the whole thing. Well, what happened with Jesus? As soon as he exposed it in the synagogue, he's out. All the revivalists, every one of them got kicked out. Why? Because they said, we know what you're doing. What did Jesus do? We, this whole thing is you're entrapping people. You're not, you're not setting people free, right? Okay, so if you stand off the carousel and you watch things, you'll start to see the trend. You'll start to see what's really going on. If you're caught up in it, it's too close. And you're not going to see the lies. That's why God is calling the church out. Why has it taken so long for people? Uh, you know, we went through that phase where we had meetings and churches and ministries that, that kind of like uh, we wanted to be cool so that the world would like us. And so then we became like the world and then we couldn't help anybody. We couldn't help ourselves or the world because we had compromised. We didn't have the power anymore. And that's what was the phase we just went through. And then the devil set it all up so that when the diseases came, we weren't ready to pray a powerful prayer of healing and break the power of any disease that came at us. So Psalms 91 appeared to not be effective for a lot of people. And a lot of good people passed away that didn't have to pass away. And it was because we were lulled to sleep and no one wanted to stand up and say, we're wrong. So I watched all this happen and I thought, well, what would someone do if they were reading about this in the next generation, reading the books about this? And they were saying, wow, see, we would see, we would look and we would see, we would read and we would know because you know, when you watch the games, football, when you watch, you can see what you could have done better. Because you're up looking at it from up here and you're sitting there drinking your drink and your snacks and everything. And they're out there sweating and trying to figure out down in there where the ball is going next and who's going to do what and what play they're on. And you're, it's so different when you're down there. And when that ball is coming at you, trust me, you can't even get out of its way, let alone catch it or kick it or anything. I'm telling you, if you haven't played these professional sports, then you really, really need to have a, them. Because I've had it happen. My, my, my relatives played professional football. And I, I've had balls thrown at me that, that felt like they were going to kill me. So then I never criticized anyone who couldn't catch a ball anymore because I had no idea all these professionals, when they throw those balls, they do this all the time and they're coming very fast. And it's really not, you know, it's the same with tennis. You have somebody that's professional that serves you and you, you're like, are you going to serve? And, and they say, I just did. And there's like this puff of smoke. I'm serious. There was a puff of smoke by my foot in front of me inbounds and I'm still like waiting for them to serve and I thought he was just warming up you know I didn't know that the ball actually came at me it's like uh, move over I'm like well you got to serve first what I just did so you go over there and you're like poof you know and there's this like so I thought you know what I'll do I'll just stick my racket out in the proper area and it knocked the racket out of my hand okay so this happened with baseball too I thought there's no way I'm going to swing at the proper time. I mean, you have no idea how fast these pitches are unless you had them. I mean, you know, you're used to playing in your backyard with wiffle ball and softball, but you're like this. And I'm thinking, okay, if I can just get it at the proper, and I can't even put it in the proper place without swinging. And then I got strike because the umpire said, well, you were out, you know, this much out. So it counts as a strike, as a swing. I'm like, man, I just want to, I want the ball to actually hit the bat once. But when it does, it knocks the bat out of your hand. Okay. It's the same thing with, with ping pong, with, you know, ping pong and everything else. It's fine as long as you're doing it in your house or, you know, in a clubhouse, whatever. But you get to into a professional level you're not able to operate in that level unless you're doing that all the time. Okay, so this is the way it is with the word of God is you, you have to make this so real that you're ready mentally 
as well as spiritually to act. So if you see a trend and you say, listen, this is not right, you have to be able to just say, you know what? This is not correct. And you don't want your whole life, your whole family, your whole church going in that direction if it's not correct, right? I mean, you, it's one thing for one person to be deceived, but you know, corruption spreads pretty fast. Okay, Isaiah 54.10. Moving on to offend others. For the mountains may depart and the hills may be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. My covenant of peace or shalom shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. So you got to get this. Things could fall apart but his love for you will not depart. You got to remember that. Okay. Well, that's the end of that. Let's get back to this. We still got, well, we got, we got some time left. Hey, listen to this one. 1 Peter 5.10. Never hear this preached. Um, After you have suffered a little while. I think I'm going to preach for now so that they call me and take my faith certificate away from my... After you've suffered a little while. Peter's saying this. I mean, you know, he's a little shaky right now. But he's, he's shaped up. He's an apostle. He made it in the Bible, you didn't. So, um, after you suffer a little, the God of grace, who imparts and blesses you with favor, who's called you to be his own in, in eternal glory, will himself complete and make you what you ought to be. He will establish you, ground you, securely, and strengthen you and settle you. This is going to help you because a lot of you, like I said, you're changing your mind and you're pulling back on the throttle because something happens and you think you did something wrong and it may not be anything. Sometimes you just need to go cast the devil out of your kids. It has nothing to do with you. Sometimes you need to stare at your dog and say, you know what? I'm boss. Sometimes you just need to stare at your circumstances and say, you know what? We're staying steady here. We're not doing nothing. We're not changing course. We're not going to do anything. Sometimes, sometimes you just need to know that God has already gone before you. Sometimes you have to remind yourself that he's already standing at the point that you finish your race and that he has already seen you end your race well. You have to think this way is that, I mean, I don't think about failing. I I don't think about, I always, I always have something that I can do. Like I have another engine. If I lose one, you know, I, I always have, if they won't let me meet publicly with you, I'll go to my studio. Won't even miss a weekend. That's what I did already. I've already done it for three years. It only helped. It only helped everything, the school, everything. It quadrupled our presence. So when we did, when we went into this isolation, God just made a bunch of church houses out of it. So there were more churches than if the devil would have just let it go. John 1, 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So in him is life. So you're in him, and that life is the light of men. So you have to remember, because you're in him, and that life is in you, 
that it is going to help you, but it's going to also going to help others. Just, you, I look for the effect of that light in other people. I look for that influencing other people. I watch you. I see, is, is this working? Is this something that I need to do? Or do I need to go back to my room right now? I have to see that you are still receiving. And I have to see that it's going to change you permanently. You're never, ever going to forget this. All right. Second Corinthians chapter one, verse 20, for as many as there are promises of God, they all find their yes in him. For this reason, we also utter the amen. So be it to God through him, to the glory of God. So you give him your yes. All his promises are yes and amen, period. All his promises. All right, so I've been waiting for this. I've been waiting for this moment for a long time. The angels are starting to sing. I can hear them singing. The angels right now, there's angels. There's, I, right, there's just one right here. Just going in a circle this way. He's singing. He's just singing right now. I just, I've been, I wait for this because this happens at every spirit school, but, uh, you know, you, it's usually the last service, but he's come early. But he's singing, he's singing. I can hear him. And then there's others singing along with him. There, so there's a harmony going on. There's some sort of harmony going on. I can hear others singing, right? This is, I don't understand this, but this is when, uh, I mean, I have the understanding what it means, but I don't know why it happens. But the angels come when everybody's spirit connects with each other. Through the ministry of the word, it takes uh, several days sometimes. And then what happens is the word, it, it is incorruptible, but it, it, actually, is, it, it actually connects with you. It synchronizes with you. It's the incorruptible seed. And it connects us together. And once everyone starts to settle in with what is being heard, each one of our spirits start to connect. And that is when the angels come in and start singing. It happens, I'd say, almost every time. But it usually happens tonight. And then it's the glorious it's a, it's a glorious time, like it's, it's timeless. It's like there is no clocks anymore. It has happened. We're all one in here. We're all one. And the blood has been applied. The, the oil has been applied. The spirit is on us. We all have come into one in agreement with each other. It's a supernatural event that happened just by the ministry of the word. And now you're sensing what it's like in heaven, in your hearts, because it's going to be like this forever, forever. We're going to have each other forever. And we're all going to experience this. And we're going to rule and reign with him. We're going to be sent out on assignments and missions that are beyond description. We're going to be honored. We're going to be in the glory together. We're going to be ruling and reigning, representing him. There's so many more things that are going to happen in eternity that are just not even written or spoken yet. And the spirit of the Lord just wants to tell you, well done, well done. The Lord is pleased with you. So let him speak to you right now. There's nothing more I can say. He wants to speak to you. He wants to, he wants to talk to you.
Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So holy in here, so full of the holiness of God in this room. No devil can stand in this room. Holy is the Lord God. Righteous, majestic are you, beautiful, most high God. There's no one like you. You are the most high, far above all rule and authority you reign. Your name is the greatest and the most high. We love you. We worship you. We will worship no other gods. We pledge our allegiance to you, O God, and through the Lord Jesus Christ, the lamb that was slain. All of us, Lord, we, pre we pay our respects and our worship to you. And you alone are God, commander of our faith. We bow before you, Lord. We worship you in submission, Lord. You are our king. You are God. Whatever you say goes, we will listen to no other voice but yours. We honor you. We humble ourselves before you. Holy is the Lord God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. Lo he kama, ishalavi ya trosia to kere tre. Sonde le mene trodino semele kanama la lama ni dio sholo. Sante di la katiriti de shotode faritra shotosi karadinte. Pero ama le maranente se kola mane tre sonata. Pela lame si ne kola bara tra shotoski shia lama. Eno ama ema lena i keria to sia lana per tre sia to saso kora veran drancha. Seco alana mianto de kisha lorote vanita. So so kora vetra shitoski si ba dia ton tesha. They say, Re Anaso, Kinama Indo and Shindika Balanite, Josikiri Dreshitoke, Fontento Nim Parandrashino, Sanso Minkin and Benendrashitoke, Ha, Vera, yeah, yeah, it's gonna all make sense later. It's gonna all make sense later. Take it in, spit out the things that are not good, let them go, forgive, just let it go, walk, you'll, you'll figure it out later. The gates are open, just walk through. Walk through. Haha, <laughs> 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 days of glory ahead. Days of my father walking among you. Days of my father walking among you ahead. <sighs> he is creating a habitation for himself in his body. Eat of the hidden manna. Drink of the wells of salvation. Drink deeply of me, says the Lord. Eat the hidden manna. The angels are singing. The angels are singing. The angels are here. Heaven has come. Heaven is rejoicing, singing, singing to the Lord. Sing with the angels. Sing with the angels. Heaven has come. 
sing. Sing. <laughs> Sing, sing unto the Lord a new song. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 